So let me start by saying, as I always do with a lot of these classes, that there's four key tasks of influential communication. There's four things we're trying to do. One is we're trying to build trust and rapport. We've got to, in our communication, recognize that if we're going to influence people, they have to like us, they have to trust us, and building that trust and that likability is part of one of the things that we're trying to do in our communication. The second thing is we're trying to help people create clarity because the reason that we try to influence folks in sales is to get them to like us and trust us enough that they would allow us to influence them in making a decision and then taking action, right? And so that requires that we help them get clarity. The third thing we're trying to do is to facilitate that decision. The fourth thing is to inspire action because look, at the end of the day, making decisions that don't lead to action don't get anybody anywhere. One of the things I learned as a therapist is there's a ton of people around the planet that have tons of insight. They are totally clear as to why their life is a train wreck. They're just not prepared to do anything different yet. And so insight that doesn't lead to action doesn't change people's lives. It doesn't sell homes. It doesn't you know, create good opportunities for your buyers and sellers. That's the task of communication. And I'm gonna share with you a model that I learned from Joel Rico. Joel is a guy who I met years ago. And um, many folks who've been around Keller Williams for a while know Joel. He has been part of our Keller Williams coaching program for a long time. Uh, Joel runs his business, I believe in Sacramento or somewhere in California. He's a sales agent himself. He runs a, a pretty successful real estate business, but he always also was part of our coaching program at Keller Williams. We have what we call MAPS coaching. And MAPS, like everything in this company, is an abbreviation. It stands for um, Mega Agent Productivity Solutions or something like that. And, and Joel wrote a program that he taught for years called The Language of Sales. And it was a program that was steeped in neurolinguistic language and communication patterns. And he taught that for years and years and years. In the past three years or so, as Keller Williams has moved more into a technology realm, uh, what Joel did is he decided to take his coaching into his own company. He started his own coaching firm, still a Keller Williams agent for sales, but he has his own coaching company. And the language of sales, which I believe was copywritten under KW, has been expanded and redeveloped and re-engineered into what he calls the language of agreement, which is his course that you can take online for a fee. And, and one of the things that Joel talks about, and I, I took the language of sales with him several times, he's a really, really good coach. And um, the question in chat, let me sidebar for a second. These four tasks apply to sellers and buyers. These four tasks apply to communication with anyone that you're trying to influence their, their behavior. Sometimes it's sellers, sometimes it's buyers, sometimes it's your kids, right? Good luck with that one. Um, the first thing that Joel said, though, about objection handling is we get these objections, right? We've got we've to understand that people are not going to automatically agree with everything that we say. And so we've got to adopt the right mindset in terms of what is an objection even in the first place. And, and what, what Joel would say is that it's, it's nothing more than a request for more information, it's resistance that says, I'm not ready to move forward because I don't have enough information yet. There's something that doesn't sit right with me. I need more clarity on it. And remember, part of our task, our four critical tasks is to create clarity. Now, Jeb Blount is another name who I, I teach a lot of his work. He's uh, another great sales trainer, not specific to real estate, but in the, in the sales space, um, has written many books, one of them called Objections. What Jeb says, is that objections are a request for more information. He also says that the resistance is based in fear, that there's something that's causing us to be afraid to take that next step to move forward. And, and he has his model for how do you handle that? How do you help people probe into that area of fears? But what Joel Rico says is number one, it's a request for more information. It's, not a, it's a mismatch in perception. I see things this way, you see things that way. It's not a no. Right? A lot of times when we get an objection, what we hear is people are saying no to us. You know, if they're going to say no, frequently what they'll say is no. An objection more often than not is not yet. It's, I'm, there's still something missing. It's not a no. It's not an attack. And what he says is we've got we've to let go of trying to be right. 
because so many times when we get an objection, what we do is we feel like I presented something, you didn't agree with me, now I have to show why I'm right and you're wrong. And we try to handle the objection sometimes by, by trying to school people on, I've been doing this longer, I'm more knowledgeable, let me tell you why you're wrong in your perception. And, and I don't know if you've ever tried to um, take that approach with a loved one. Um, it doesn't usually end well. And what, what Joel says is, look, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to, we've got to see this not as a right or wrong issue. It's, I just see things differently. And how can I let go of the need to be right and help you see things from a different lens? John Maxwell, some of you may know his name one of the great leadership trainers uh, of, of our generation and uh, uh, someone who I, I, I do some work for the John Maxwell organization as a coach and trainer in that world. And I remember John one time talking about um, how he had a conversation with his wife early on about have, every time they got an, into an argument, John would always win. Now, John is a, a skilled trainer. He's an ordained pastor. He's an author of over 70 books. He is probably one of the most sought after um, uh, keynote speakers in the leadership space, largely in business. And John is a really good, you know, really good at communicating. And he recognized his wife said to him, look, every time we get into an argument, you always win. And he was like, you know, kind of proud of himself and saying, you know what, I, I'm, I'm damn good at what I do, right? I'm, I'm always winning. And she says, you know, John, you're winning all the arguments, but you're losing my love. And, and that got his attention. You know, that does get your attention when you hear that he talks about how he didn't sleep that night. And he recognized that you can, you can win the battle, but lose the war. And I see too many times that we try to handle objections in sales by trying to prove why we're right and they're wrong. And even when you are right, because newsflash, the customer ain't always right. And, and I'm gonna underscore that again, many times, because you're more knowledgeable about what you're doing and they're not, many times the customer isn't right. However, their perception is more important than yours is. And so one of the things that Joel says is the sooner you can let go of being right and try to find a way to expand and clarify and create a world where you can start to see things in, in the same way, you don't have to worry about winning the battle and losing the war. That's John and that's his wife, Margaret. That's Margaret who kind of taught him that lesson. So how do we do it? What do we do? Well, the first thing that we do is we got to help people begin to feel that they're right. There's a three-step model that I'm going to share with you. How does step number one, step number two, step number three go? Then what I want us to do is to go into breakout rooms and just take a couple of typical real estate objections. Like I want to price it higher than you're asking. And how are we going to handle those objections using this model that I'm going to share with you? Here's how it goes. Simple. Step number one, find a place where you can agree. Now, when I say agree, I mean agree authentically, right? Find a place where you can authentically agree with their perspective. And sometimes that doesn't mean saying to them, you're right and I'm wrong you know what, we want to list the house for $100,000 above what your asking price is. I'm not going to say to them, yes, that's a good idea, if I think it's a bad idea. But what can we agree upon? How do I communicate to them that, you know, your perception of wanting to list it higher isn't crazy, right? And, and you can do it with things like, look, I can appreciate that. A statement like, I can appreciate that. A statement like, I can see how you could feel that way. A statement like, I could see how someone could get that impression. I could see how people could come to that conclusion. You know, of course, a lot of agents would give you a big number as a way of getting your business. I could see why, if you've met with another agent who told you that they could get you more money, why you would want to list higher. The first thing we do is we got to get on the same side of the argument and let them know that we don't see them as adversaries. I'm not going to fight with you. I'm not necessarily going to agree that you're right, but I at least see that your perception of the world is valid. Might not be correct, but it's, it's valid. Step number one is come to some authentic agreement, get on their side. Now, what do you do next? You gotta take it to the next level. The next level is to try to get people to think bigger. 
And, and this is where once we get that acknowledgement, we get on the same side of the argument, if you will, we can provide education, we can ask questions. It can sound like this. Hey, you know what? I wanna list the house $100,000 more than you're saying, Hal. I can appreciate why you might wanna do that. But can I tell you what concerns me about that? I can appreciate why you'd wanna do that. I'm getting into a place of agreement. And now I'm gonna to try to stretch their perspective. Can I, can I tell you what concerns me about that? And what they're gonna do is they're gonna say, okay, tell me. And I'm gonna say whatever concerns me. You know, If we start too high, you know, my fear is that we're not gonna be able to attract the buyers that we need to create the momentum that we want. What would happen if your way didn't work? You know, um, if we list for $100,000 above what the comps are telling us, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, how will we get the buyers to come see it when they could see homes that are similar for $100,000 less? What we're trying to do in step number two is to stretch their perceptions from their narrow view into a broader view. And we're going to do it largely with questions that ask them to see it in a different way. How and what, correct, how and what questions can be really useful here? What would happen if we tried your way and it didn't work? How would we get the buyers to come out if it's priced higher? Um, this is not scripted. I don't have a script per se. What I want you to understand is the model. Rule number one is get on the same side of the argument with an acknowledgement. Rule number two, step number two is try to expand their thinking. And then once we do that, step number three, and here's the key. The moment we get any kind of buy-in to the way that we're probing in section number two. So for example, um, Hal, I want to list it for $100,000 more. I can appreciate why you might want to do that. That's a lot of money. Making more money is not a crazy idea, right? I'm acknowledging, I'm getting into an authentic agreement. Number two, can I tell you what concerns me? If we price it $100,000 higher than the comps, how would we get buyers to come out and see it when they could see homes that are similar for $100,000 less? The moment I get a response from them, something like, you know, that's something that, you know, it's a good point. I hadn't really thought of that. Anything that gets them to acknowledge that they're beginning to see the world from our perspective, then we move on to step number three. And step number three is this. It's asking them to take a step forward. So we would say something like, Right. So we should price it here so that you can get the get to Florida and get with those grandkids, right? And so here's how that flows. Hal, I want to list it for $100,000 more than the comp suggests. I think I want to try it. I can appreciate why you want to do that. It's a lot of money. It's not crazy. Can I tell you what concerns me? Step two. Here's what my concern is. My fear is buyers are not going to come. How would we get buyers to come if we if they can see similar things? You know, that's something... Hadn't really thought about that. I can see that, but I want to try it. But the moment I get a glimmer of, I, I see your perspective, something I hadn't thought about, then we move right on to step three, right? So should we price it here so that you can really get onto Florida? And, and this is where step three is where we're going to kind of close around motivation largely. I think what we recognize is that moving forward, and trying to get them to take action based on achieving their objective, which by the way, is not selling the house. Why does the person wanna sell the house? When we're doing our evaluations and our listing presentations and we're doing our qualifying, one of the things we're trying to learn and uncover is their motivation. Nobody wants to sell their house and go through all the drama of getting it cleaned up and getting it on the MLS and having people come in and people come out Nobody wants to go through that disruption unless they're trying to do it for another reason. What is the reason you're selling your house? Well, I want to sell the house because my, my family lives in Florida. I want to get down there before the winter time because I hate winter in New Jersey and I want to see the grandkids more often. And so what we're going to do when we close is not, should we price it here so we can get the house sold? The house sold is the intermediate step. We, we're going to close with things like, should we price it here so that you can get to Florida and be with the grandkids. That's the motivation. You see the difference between the two? Do you feel the difference between the two? One is closing to complete a task, the, the transactional task of getting the house sold. And a lot of times what some of our scripts do is we focus too much on the transaction. 
if I could show you how I could sell the house quicker and for more money than anybody else, is it worth 20 minutes of our time is a common script. But selling the house is what we're doing to try to get into a life change. And so I would amend that to be, if I could show you how we could get your home sold so you could get to Florida and actually spend more quality time with your grandkids, would that be worth 20 minutes of our time to get together? Always think about what's the motivation. And in step three, we're going to ask them to take a step forward through our perspective to achieve their motivational goal. Does that make sense? Now, that's a lot to remember, right? And another example here would be when they say, you know what, Hal, I hadn't really thought about that. It might be harder to get people to come in. Exactly. So why not do the right thing and list your home with me tonight? Now, if you've been in other classes, what you're noticing here, what do we call this? Anybody remember price it here? Do the right thing. List your home. Do you remember the linguistic technique? An embedded command, right, Nabila? It's a command that we're structuring, we're embedding into the sentence, we're embedding this command language to start to speak to their pre-conscious. And we're doing it, and you notice the dots before and the dots after we're doing with a little pause before and a little pause after because that little gap in the sentence causes the listeners unconscious to tune in more. So it sounds like this. So should we price it here? so that you can get to Florida and be with the grandkids. So why not do the right thing and list your home tonight, right? We're just putting a little gap before, a little gap after. It's a linguistic tool that we use for making those commands, which are instructions of what do we want them to do? We want them to do the right thing. We want them to price it here, right? That's what we're doing. These are the rules of this script. So. We're going to spend about 25 minutes and, and, and just as a, as, a, as a recap, well, before I get to the recap, once we get through step three, step number one, get to an authentic agreement, take their side. Step number two, stretch them into a different perspective. Step number three, request that they move forward. Once we do that, what we're going to find is we're going to either overcome the objection. All right, Nabila, that makes sense. Let's sign the paperwork and let's list it at your price or they're gonna dig in deeper and we're gonna have to go back to the top or maybe we're gonna find something else that they've objected to. Well, you know, Nabila, if, if we're gonna price it $100,000 lower, then I worry that I'm not gonna net as much money as I need to to buy my next house. Would you lower your commission? Now we go back to the top. We're gonna to get on the same side of the argument. We're gonna, hey, I can appreciate why you want me to do that. And we're gonna handle it in the same model right? The three steps we're going to practice today. Number one, when you get an objection, take their side, do it with an acknowledgement, do it with something that says to them, I'm not agreeing that you're right, but you're also not crazy for thinking that, right? We're, we're kind of letting them know that we're allies. The law of reciprocity comes into play here, guys. Remember the law of reciprocity when I've talked about it before? What does that say? Anybody understand the law of reciprocity? <clears throat> if I was to, um, Fatima, you want to play a quick game with me real quick? Real quick. If I'm looking at you and say, hi, my name is Hal. What's your name? What would you say? You're muted right now. So you're, whatever you're saying, I won't hear. I'm bad. You hear me now? I hear you. Hi, my name's Hal. What's your name? Hi, my name is Fatima. Fatima. So what happened there in that interaction? I gave her my name. And because I did it first, it made it easier for her to give you know, her name to me. If I just saw her and said, hey, you, lady with the glasses, what's your name? You know what she's going to say? I'm not going to tell you my name. Who are you, creepy guy? Right? The law of reciprocity, when we do things for people, they feel inclined to want to do things back for us. That's the way the human brain works. And the reason why we take their side is because it triggers the law of reciprocity. When I agree with you, you're going to feel inclined to want to agree more with me. When I disagree with you, you're going to feel inclined more to dig in and disagree with me. And so step number one, find some common agreement, take their side. Step number two, offer uh, uh, a new perspective. 
have you looked at it this way? What would happen if we did it that way? We do this largely with questioning. What would happen if we tried it and it didn't turn out? If we ended up trying it for six months and we lost our best window to get the best buyers, do you have concerns that we're not going to sell the price that you want? If we don't get the price that you want, is that something? It's just lots of questions here to stretch their thinking. And the moment we get some sort of an acknowledgement, some sort of buy-in that we, we get something like, yeah, okay, I hadn't thought about that. The moment we get some sort of agreement that they're seeing things through our lens, then what we're gonna do is move on to the request to step forward. Um, and we're gonna ask them to move forward with a close that says something like, terrific. So let's do the right thing and price it right so we can get you to Florida. Those are the three steps. And like anything else, it's something that we're just learning. It's something that we're practicing. The first couple of times we go into a Zoom breakout room, it's not going to come off perfectly, but that's why we're practicing. Because the more we practice here, the more confident we feel when we're out there with buyers and sellers. So I'm going to ask you, what questions do you have about this before we go into breakout rooms? Do you have any questions about what we're doing, what the activity is? Even Hamali, I see you there and your cameras are closed, which is fine. Uh, Dami, your camera's closed as well. Are you all still here? Because I want to make sure I put you into breakout rooms. Uh, yes, okay. uh, Eve. Good, perfect. And Hamali, are you here too? I'm going to trust that Hamali is still here. Here's how we do this with breakout rooms. If you've been in Ignite, you're familiar with the breakout room process. I'm just going to set up two rooms which is basically three people each. And I, here's- Yes, here's I'm here. Oh, good to see you. Well, good to hear you. Here are the, uh, the objections that we can work with. Guys, and, and you can take a screenshot of these, write these down. I don't think you're gonna see the PowerPoint in the breakout rooms. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna practice how do we handle these couple of objections? And there are some of the common ones that we get, like we don't wanna price it the way you suggest. We wanna price it higher. Because you never get the objection that says, you know what, I think your price is way too high. We want to sell it for less money. That's not one you're going to get, right? Here's another common one. We don't think you have enough experience selling homes in our neighborhood. How would you handle that using these three models? You know what, I can appreciate how you could come to that conclusion. But let me ask you a couple of questions, right? And how are we going to expand their thinking, right? Uh, here's another common objection. We think we should wait until spring to buy or sell. You know what? I can appreciate why you feel that way. That's not crazy. But can I share with you what concerns me about that? You know, do you know how strong the market is right now? Do we have any guarantees that the market's going to be this strong in the spring? Do What would happen if interest rates go up and we have less buyers in the marketplace? How would that impact? Would that make it easier or harder for you to sell it at your price? All of these kinds of questions expanding that perspective. Um, question, objection number four. We want to relist it with our previous agent. This is for an expired. Question number five. We think we can sell it without hiring an agent. There's just a handful of objections that we get in this industry. But what I want us to do is just practice these objections with this model. So again, one last thing on the model. You might want to, again, just take a quick screenshot of this as to what's step one, what's step two, what's step three or write it down on a piece of paper before we break out. And here's how we're gonna do it. I just saw some more folks enter the room. We're gonna now set breakout rooms for probably 20 minutes, just to get a feel for how does this play out. I'm gonna do two breakout rooms. Some of you will have three, one of you will have four. We're gonna set the rooms for about, oops, hit the wrong button there, don't wanna do that. Um, we're gonna set the rooms for about 15 minutes and we're just gonna practice using these three steps. And then we're gonna come back and talk about how that went. Who has questions before we get going? You have that list of objections? All right, cool. Then I'm gonna set these rooms. I'm gonna pop in and see how things are going with you guys. And then in about 15 minutes, we're gonna come back to the main room and, and talk about it. All right, here we go. Put on your crash helmets. We're gonna do some Zoom time travel. All righty. Hello. Did we get everybody back? Yes. On paper, this seems so easy. <laughs> yeah. In real life. Yeah. <laughs> in real life, 
it's a little more complicated, isn't it? That's why we practice, right? Because the truth is learning the rules is great, right? Um, in, in college, I was a music major for a while till I realized I couldn't feed my family. Um, and, and again, I got to honest truth. I was a keyboard major, not a performance major, but I was a keyboard major. And I envied the jazz musicians. I envied them because they could just go out there and, and once they learned the rules, they could just riff off each other. And it just was so easy and so effortless. Learning the rules is important, but guess what? Those jazz players practice their scales like crazy. They, they practice and practice and practice all the time. Knowing the rules is great, but we got to carve out some time to practice. How do I do this? So the model simply, this is Joel's model. And I think it's a good model because it's simple. It's three steps. Number one, get on the, find some authentic agreement. Don't manufacture agreement. Don't agree that they're right if they're not. When you get an objection on your commission, don't agree that your commission is too high. That's not what I'm suggesting. But what I do want you to authentically agree is, yeah, I can appreciate why you'd want me to lower my commission. 6% of the sale price is a lot of money. I get that, right? That's not crazy. Now we move on to step two. How do we expand our thinking through questioning, through education? Have you thought about it this way? What would happen if this turned out? If we try it your way and it doesn't work out, what would be the next step? You know, uh, can I tell you what concerns me about this, about doing it your way? Right. And the moment we get some sort of buy-in or acknowledgement that they start to come over and say, you know what, that's something that I haven't really thought about. You make a good point, Hal. That's when we go on to step three, which is ask them to take a step forward our way. And we do it by acknowledging frequently that they are starting to see it our way. Hey, I, I, great. So let's do the right thing. Let's price the home according to what the comps say so that we can actually get you home, your home sold and you off to Florida or whatever their motivation is. We know these rules, now we just need more time to practice, right? So the script lab is just one place to practice and um, not enough practice. You know, half an hour, 20 minutes, once a week, ain't gonna do it. What we need to be doing is finding each other, pairing up with each other, find an agent in your office, find an agent in the Zoom, uh, find somebody in your life who's willing to play the client and you kind of go and, and play the agent. But the more practice we do, the better. Um, what questions do you have about this objection handling model before we wrap it up? Eva gave us a very hard time in our class. You know, she's like that, that Eva. She's a <laughs> I, You know, I'm just repeating what I've been told by my Eva's been doing this a couple of years. And when you do this a couple of years, you get some real objections and you're like, all right, let's try this. And, guys, and then you just tear well, your hair. I gave up. I told her, never mind, don't sell your house, bye-bye. You know what, and you know, truth be told, I think every one of us has been tempted and maybe even once or twice said something like that on the phone. You know, look, here's, here's the thing. Even people that are really well practiced in their scripts periodically get an objection that they, that they can't handle. And they go down in flames. It's what happens. And what do you do when you go down in flames? You take yeah. that one and you go back into your circle of people that you practice with and say, okay, this is what happened. And I crashed and burned. Guys, help me out. What would you do next time? How would you handle it? Right? And together you grow. That's how you do it. But it's all about making the time to do this practice. Learn the model and then keep practicing. Step number one, find authentic agreement. Step two, find a way to help expand their perspective. Step three, once we get any kind of agreement, request that they move forward. And once you kind of get this one down, it's one of a myriad of different objection handling tools out there. But I'm telling you, Joel has made a lot of money as an agent and as a coach teaching people this simple model because it doesn't feel like you're fighting with me. You can win the battle and lose the war. You can win the argument and lose the client. You, you could, like I said, John and Margaret Maxwell, you know what, John, you win all the arguments, but you're losing my love. Mm. Bad spot to be in with your partner, right? So, um, all right. Anything else before we wrap up? I'm going to jump into an office hour shortly, but any other questions that you have about this model? No? All right, then we'll be back next Monday. At two o'clock, we'll come back with another one. All right, thank you. In the meantime, have a good afternoon, guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you.